So I'd like to introduce you our next speaker, Anastasia. Uh, she is a mobile technical uh, lead at uh, COSAC uh, Lab. Uh, and uh, two favorite questions of Anastasia are mobile and security. So uh, let's uh, listen to uh, the presentation. All right, so hello. Um, first of all, thank you that you survived after yesterday party. I heard that it was an awesome party. And you're here in the morning and you're here in my talk. I'm really, really glad to see you here. And some of you know, some of you don't, but we all fail at building secure mobile apps. It's just that many of you fail more often. Today, me and my friend, the box, will try to eliminate some of these failures. So keep an eye on the box. This is a box of secrets. It's very important in today's talk, OK? So who am I? I am a software engineer. I do write mobile applications for the last six years, kind of. I do write client side and the server side, and now I work as a mobile tech lead in a product development in a Cossack Labs UK company, a super secret crypto think tank. And I speak often about security, and this talk is a, like one of maybe complicated talks I do it, I do, and if you understand that this talk is a little bit complicated for you and you don't have a mood to listen to all these things, just feel free to go and grab some coffee. I'm okay with that. Of course, I will remember your faces, but I'm okay with it. However, I will try to entertain you and I have a plan for today. As usual, we will start our journey step by step. Discovering infrastructure layout, digging into ideas of threats, trust and keys, discussing key management system, what is a key generation, how to revoke keys, and other super exciting theoretical things. And, of course, we will apply all this knowledge to our mobile apps and talk about secrets, of course. First, let's talk about establishing trust. How do we, how do we know that we should trust someone? For example, how do you know that the guy or girl talking with you on the phone is actually your friend? Probably you recognize him or her by voice, by some typical words, right? But how about a stranger? Probably you use some secret keyword, but this is human communication. Uh, we have a super mess, and there are a lot of ways to build trust with people who, don't, who you don't know and can't easily recognize by sharing passwords, by asymmetric keys, by zero-knowledge proof protocols, etc. Where do we establish trust? This is our typical layout. The servers, the mobile, the data in transit in the public channels, and so on. I mean, this like a, a real things, like cables and stuff. And our infrastructure is full of keys and data in all those cables, right? The cables. Cables are important. They are out of your control. And on the point you leave your office, actually, you rely on these creatures. Why do we need trust? To protect the data in those cables, where AVLCI and better crackers are looking for your secrets. Using super secret mathematical techniques, we provide guarantees of confidentiality, authenticity, and integrity towards protected data, bound to trusted keys and secrets. How does it work? Well, of course, magic, uh, kinda. Actually, Protection means that we provide those guarantees by binding them to a key via a certain mathematical process. Like you input a key or two and receive a result. What else do you need to know? It's provable and hackable if you manage the keys correctly. So since keys are what we trust, 
and they control trust in our system. Managing keys is managing trust. So let's talk about key management. This is, sounds like a topic for a presentation, actually. It's a little bit late, like 14 slides later, but we got to the topic. Like, no, secrecy. Reliving, uh, revealing secrets with a little bit penalty. Well, okay, um, what is a key? Key actually is a ray of bytes. It's, it's easy. But depending on the process, what's going on, there are different kind of keys. For example, we use secret keys for symmetric ciphers. We use public and private key pair for asymmetric ciphers. There are also passwords. Passwords are strings that you can remember, but they are poor keys. By the way, we can use a key derivation function, KDF, to improve passwords, but we will talk about it a little bit later. And of course, there is a one-time pin. It's something short that you actually receive, for example, uh, when you're doing authorization via your bank account, right? Small thing that you got in SMS. We won't talk a lot about one-time pin, but we will talk about uh, symmetric, asymmetric keys and about passwords. What kind of keys do we know in our nice, shiny iOS applications? Well, and Android applications as well. well actually, in any applications, to be honest. This is engineering excellence, right? So any applications. By the way, raise your hands who are iOS developers. OK, like half. Android developers. OK, like, I know, one third, probably. Who are not developers? At all? One, two, three. Hi, people. I sh I'm glad that you're here. I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm happy to see you here. So, uh, key keys. What kind of keys do we know? Um, application tokens, passwords, certificates, these are familiar things to you, right? This, all, all of these things are actually keys from security point of view. Why do we need these keys for? Keys protect the data and they let access to the data. They allow you to verify data's authenticity and integrity. What kind of data? Actually, all user-generated data that we really care about in our apps, but not really, not only. It's also access to external resources, Pardon. Access to external resources like APIDs, like server tokens, like server URLs. And of course, this is super important, identifiable data of our users, of other users that actually use your app. Not your user, not your current user of the app, but others. For example, those people who like your tweets. If actually there are any people who like it, tweets, but so if keys, uh, what we protect data from? Well, you know there are a lot of threats we can imagine, and a lot of threats we can and we can't handle, like data tampering, like passive and active man in the middle, um, like really common problems, like. I know, rubber hose script analysis. We can imagine all those threads in our layout. The thing is that keys, they are array of bytes and they are stored somewhere and attackers want them to unlock protected data and to facilitate, facilitate trust, right? Keys are small chunks of data and they are subject to threads too. So, the same picture is uh, true for keys as well. There is no magic. We are in the same situation talking about data and talking about keys. The thing is that protecting 128 bytes of data, it's a little bit easier than protecting 50 files. But the problem is the same. We just narrowed the attack surface to a small thing, a key. So what can happen with keys? First of all, attacker can steal the keys, and this is obviously bad, right? 
Then what is worse, attacking a stolen keys can be replayed. They can be used to access something else. And as a result, the worst case scenario, if attacker is lucky and you are not, keys can be replaced, which means that attacker can throw in his evil keys into your code to access resources. So we need to build a system that protects and manages keys, yet preserves usability. You know, in a key management, there is one practical goal. Trust and security are preserved, yet system is usable. Because if you don't do that, you will end up with another ultra-secure, super-paranoid system like nobody willing to use. That's why we're talking about user-friendly, something user-friendly, something user-friendly for key management. And this system consists of several processes which are linked sequentially. From generation to key exchange, from exchange to storage and access, with relocation, with control of compromised keys and outdated keys, with rotation to ensure the key lifetime. Sometimes the system should contain service processes too, like backups or admin access to encrypted data. We will talk about all these processes one by one and then move to some practical things. So, first of all is key generation. The goal of key generation is to create mathematically strong trust tokens, ones that can stand against brute force and smart enumeration. You need to use good random number generator for that, combined with a nice algorithm and secret to produce a key. To ensure that it does not leak, key needs to be produced in a super specified place. For example, where user has input his or her password, or where, um, where it's safe to store key. The idea is to limit time in your app when the key is alive and plain text, but actually is not used. So it's super important to generate key in the right time, in the right place in your application flow. How to generate key? Well, it's easy. This is one of the examples to generate a key pair using elliptic curves cryptography. And it looks really nice. I know it's Swift, but it looks like Kotlin-like, right? So just imagine instead let there is val, totally Kotlin style. Uh, this is these two lines comes from library I maintain from Themis, which actually the main goal of this library is to make all these awful security things really easy to line. And um, let's talk about passwords. I told that a pass password is not a good key because it's easy to brute force and usually users come up with a poor passwords like one, two, three, four, five, or QWERTY, QWERTY, Coca-Cola, I love you, and so on. And key derivation function or KDF uh, help to convert small and shitty passwords to nice, strong, cryptographically strong keys. So attackers will be sad you actually can use KDF from native, uh, from native libraries in your platform. For example, from Common Crypto in iOS, and I'm sure from Security Main Security Framework in Android. And some libraries have already KDF inside. For example, in Temis, you don't need to use KDF explicitly because it's built in. But the thing is that if you handle passwords directly, Please don't use them as user input them. Drop them with a KDF. Like never store this kind of user passwords. After we generated the keys, the next step is exchange key between trusted parties. And keys ch key exchange is essential process in establishing trust. We need to exchange keys. We need to distribute them. And there are different approaches how to do that. You probably remember a story about Alice and Bob, the dodo birds, yes? Okay, okay, I, I, I see your faces, so raise your hands, who actually understands why all these nice dodo birds are here. 
One, two, three. Okay, it's five of them. For those who don't know the story, it's like a, you know, um, a reference to another story. So these are the dog birds. Alice, she represents the app. And Bob, he represents the server. And Bob is staying on a ball, which stands on the middle, to represent that the server side is a little bit, you know, fragile. So Alice and Bob, they are communicating. And in our case, Alice just sends a password to Bob. And of course, there is a Fennec Fox. <coughs> Fennec Fox. Fox, she is a hacker in this system because her name is Eve. That's, that's why she has so large ears, because she eavesdrop. And she actually listens in the line and, inter, um, and intercept the connection. So it's just this, the, the, the short intro. So we're talking about key exchange, right? So in the world of passwords, Alice just tells Bob the secret. And sometimes it's fine, but sometimes the fox hears the secret and it knows everything. And it can impersonate anybody and steal, steal any data. The idea is just don't please don't send passwords and keys in a plain text. In asymmetric worlds, things are a little bit better because Alice and Bob have a key pair, public and private keys, and they exchange only public keys. So anyway, they need to trust each other and to hide secrets from Fennec Fox. And they share their public keys and this actually enables them to trust each other. So they are building trust by sharing keys and they are isolating Fennec Fox from the system. That's why she actually, uh, okay, okay. That's why she cries in a corner because now Fennec Fox cannot intercept connections so easy. The idea is that we need to share public keys in a trusted fashion to achieve that. Let's move forward. Let's move to the key storage. Key storage is a big deal. We need to store keys securely in a way which minimizes risk. One big point here, please don't store keys with encrypted data. I mean, don't store keys that decrypt this data with encrypted data. Of course, you know where to store keys in your ecosystem, right? We will touch this a little bit later. But once keys are stored, we want to access them. And this is tricky, because from one point, keys should be stored super secure somewhere deep. But from another point, we should access them easily. Only for authorized for processes and people who authorized. So we are kind of putting keys in a deep, deep, deep place, but still allows anyone authorized to access them easily. Now, when keys are generated and stored, do they live forever? Of course, no. The key life cycle is a biography of a single Mr. Key from a birth to oblivion and the life cycle is specifies when keys should no longer be used for encryption, when keys should no longer be used for decryption, when keys are not keys, are keys no more. And this is super important. But another important thing is a key rotation. You don't want everything to be encrypted with one key, right? Because if you lick it, you're kind of done. You want to have several keys, one per user, one per group, and one for admin user, etc. And it's all about controlling the risk. So you should limit the quantity of data encrypted with one key, and you should think about algorithm, how to change key from the from the zero day of building your system. Because sometime it may happen, the new vulnerability in your algorithm is found and you just need to change the keys or change the algorithm and you need to make a mechanism for that. Now, when we are mostly done with theoretical things, there are the practical considerations. Apart from user features, system may have some maintenance processes which require special access to data. Imagine that your data is being encrypted 
end to end, so no one actually except the end users can access the data. For everyone, the data is encrypted. But what about backups? What about admin access? What about password resets? You should think about all this mechanism and you sh it's better to create a separate keys for all these processes. So your system will have really, really a lot of keys if you start thinking how to make it user friendly or developer friendly. Mm, one last point in this large blob about key goals and key processes. What if the key life cycle is suddenly interrupted. For example, the keys are expected to be compromised and we need to revoke them and we need to inform everyone that these keys are compromised. For example, you know, upon every SSL handshake, iOS verifies SSL certificate in a special key revocation list and if certificate is revoked, handshake fails. So actually a lot of systems already have these algorithms and processes and if you are building your own system, it's your responsibility to build all these ideas. Now, I see you aboard, so it's a practice time. Uh, let's take a look at how trust is established and how actually um, one party trusts, make a trust to another party. Let's take a look on SSL. When you connect to a server and record server certificate and then you connect again and you can compare server certificates. This actually, apart from trusting certificates itself, it's kind of built trust to the server just by comparing certificates. But it's not the only way. There is another way called mediated exchange. Mediated exchange is when you know your remote party public identifier and you can ask someone or something to provide a key for this, for this, like for another user knowing his name. For example, on iMessage, every time you create a new chat with one of your people in a contact list, Apple has its own um, servers where iMessage gets to grab the key, the public key, and to start communication. Because, you know, there is no way to communicate between these users directly until you know the keys. We are not Apple, so we can use the third-party services like Keybase.io, where you can go and find uh, public keys for some records, for some names, usernames. But those methods of both, they rely on some assumptions that you have to trust someone actually and you have to trust Kibase.io, you have to trust your server but the most simple method is just handling the keys directly, you know, hand by hand. For example, when you're building application that logs into Google or Facebook and you open the Facebook developer console or Google developer console, you copy the application ID and application secret key, right? And you put it in your code. At the moment where you're, when you're copied and put in your code, this is exactly an example of channel key exchange, where you is a channel. Just copy pasting is actually transferring keys and building a trust. So, when we have established trust, using one of these three methods, we should verify the trust. Most of the time, servers verify the app when app sends some kind of token to the server, but there are also a lot of ways how app can verify a server, like SSL pinning. Please raise your hands who have ever implemented an SSL pinning in your apps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whoop, yay. The thing is that I will stop my security speaker career when at least 90% of the audience will raise their hands answering this question. So prepare yourself. There will be a lot of security talks. Um, the thing is that SSL pinning is really easy to do. It requires a little bit of work on support, but it's really easy to implement. It's not so complicated, but it allows you to your application to understand who is it talking with, 
what is this server? Is it the same server as it's supposed to be, right? Should I, should I describe the SSL pinning in the details or let's move forward? Let's move forward, okay. If, if you will have any questions about SSL pinning, how to do the, it on iOS, on Android, just ping me after the talk, okay? Um, so, we talked about uh, key generation, we talked about an establishing trust, we talked about verifying trust. Now we're talking about storing keys. Where do we store keys, at least on iOS? Keychain, yes, I was, you know, I was drawing this picture. I thought it's obvious. Yes, on the keychain, of course. The thing is that keychain is great. However, great developers avoid storing keys at all. Keychain will break if your device is jailbroken. And sometimes you just cannot use keychain. So if you want to avoid leaking keys, just don't store them at all. But if you need to, put a lot of efforts in protecting them from prying eyes. For example, in our apps we mostly deal with two kind of keys, with user-defined keys and app-defined keys. User-defined keys is something um, defined by user, obviously. Is it something derivated from user passwords? Is it something that needs user attention in the application flow? App Defined keys is something you put in your app in the early beginning during development stage, like some tokens, like server ID, etc., etc. And they have different rules how to store them, because undefined keys can be stored encrypted, can be stored obfuscated. It's easy; you can do it during development. But using defined keys, you should also store them. Encrypted, it's better, but you cannot be prepared for this because it's something that user actually inputs during your app flow. When I talk about key protection, my colleagues think about obfuscation. There are different ways to obfuscate keys. For example, to store them as hex variables or replace characters inside keys and Obfuscation depends on social engineering. And the goal is to confuse attacker and just, you know, it's just a mind game. So, for example, if you want to store the server certificate, you can rename it to MP3 and store it like my favorite music.mp3 inside your application bundle. I know the story when one developer uh, renamed a server certificate to XIP file, to interface builder file, like blah 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 view.xip and store it in his um, application folder. So of course Xcode shows an error message trying to open this XIP, but the idea is that for attacker it's really complicated to understand that this exact file is actually a server certificate. The thing is that it's quite fatile. Well-trained attacker will break this defense in minutes. And it's better for you to spend your time on really serious things. For example, store keys encrypted. When we're talking about encrypting keys, the question is how to deal with key for encrypting key, right? And we can go deeper, deeper and deeper. Uh, the answer is super simple. Don't, just don't store those keys. It may be something app defined. You can derive a key from something you already know. For example, from application bundle, from uh, some string in your file from result of division 23 on 17. Like something defined, something you can make a function to, something generated. But when you, um, the idea is that you have your key in a plain text while you're developing, right? You use your encryption method with some generated key to encrypt this key. In your app, you stored only encrypted key. When you need this key in the application flow, you access it 
derive generate key to decrypt it, use it, and prone it from memory. So there you store only encrypted key. And it's easy to do with both app-defined and user-defined keys. It's a little bit tricky and it adds uh, some complexity in your code. But in this way, attackers never will find my secret key in your playlist file or in your user defaults or in your database. Many frameworks give you ability to do all these things really easy and just try to avoid to implement everything yourself if you can. Of course, there are native uh, platform defined mechanism, but there are also a lot of wrappers. And it's, really, it's complicated to understand what tool to use and what are good tools. I have a list how to choose your iOS crypto, to choose your iOS crypto library. And the same, there is the same list how to choose your Android crypto library by the on that link. It's not something must have. I'm just encourage you to read and maybe to expand your horizon and maybe to use a better tool that you are using right now. Another prominent technique in a school of deception is a fake keys. So the idea is to make the attacker think that he is using right key and make him use this, like, uh, write this fake key, actually, and to keep an eye on log files and to be alarmed. If you see in your log files that someone is trying to get into your servers using fake keys, this is a signal that someone is trying to break your defense and someone is trying to break your app. It works really well with another technique Three, two, one, yes. With another technique, with the honeypot. So, the idea is that um, you have these fake keys, but you store them in an obvious place, like a honeypot, to attract attacker. For example, in user define, in user defaults, um, in some in some place that is obvious, you know, you name these keys, my secret key, my server secret key, and you put a plain text there, like, please use this key, but in fact, you store your real key somewhere deep, somewhere encrypted. You're like uh, making, it's also called the poison records when we are talking about database. The important moment here is you should understand, you should analyze the logs all the time because you need to understand that someone is actually using those keys, right? Maybe you need to update a security model, maybe you need to add more difficulties into this. But this is a really cool technique and I know a lot of companies that have their products that sell uh, their products, their software, they create the whole, you know, alternative reality. A lot of files in their code that do nothing except attra uh, attracting attention of attacker. For example, how to check if your product was bought by the user. Probably you have a method in your code, is it pro user, yes or no, right? It's really to hack. The thing is that if you have a fake file, like um, check a pro user checker with this function that is used in a code, but never used, the result is never used directly. But somewhere in your code, deep inside, you have another function with not so obvious name that actually did, do, does all this work on checking whether the user has bought the product or not. This is a honeypot technique. Okay. Previously, my talk was about encryption. And now you see that encryption was really easy. But key management is hard. And um, what did we learn today? A three important key points. The keys are bytes and the keys are data. And you should protect keys as well as you're protecting your data even better. You should separate keys from data and never store them in one place. Moreover, you should think in advance, I know it's complicated, but you should think in advance 
how your key management system will look like and what key uh, actions and key mechanism you should implement to make sure that this thing will work after a month, after a year, after half a year. After a moment you will be hacked and you will need to change all your keys. That all your system will work smooth. Uh, and of course, you should maybe you should use those techniques like obfuscation, like key encryption, like honeypot, storing all these fake keys if you want. But the main point is that every system is different and there is no religion choices. And best solutions, they come from assessing your real architecture of your real system and fitting and find tools that fit your exact system. Okay? So, I will share sli slides and you will have a lot of links in those slides. And of course, there are some links for your home reading. You know, long uh, summer evenings you can spend on reading security links. Just ping me in Twitter if you really will do this. <laughs> I will send you something good, like, you know, and uh, my love and stickers. Uh, and as a Another portion of links. These are links to my slides. Actually, if this talk was a little bit complicated for you, I see your eyes. So if this talk was a little bit complicated for you, maybe you're brave enough to start from something less complicated, from the story about Alice and Bob and a fennec fox. The cute stories with nice pictures. Maybe the level is okay for you. Sorry. <clears throat> Okay, so thank you for your attention and if you have simple questions, please ask them now. But if you want to start your question from, hey, I have a system, let's talk later, okay? Okay. Thank you, very interesting. Um, my question is, is it possible to trust uh, nowadays, the fact that App Store encrypts the source code, and uh, is it uh, possible uh, to store any keys in the source code? Not in playlist, but directly in the source code. The thing is that um, it's up to you whether you want to trust Apple or you don't want. Right? So it's kind of your. I don't know. Can I trust? I don't know, it depends on your on how much effort you want to put in building your system. If you are making an, an app that, I know, the Instagram for kittens, probably it's okay for you. If you're making something that deals with more sensitive data, with financial data, with some pictures, I don't know, probably you should but put a lot. You know how easy it is to decrypt uh, source code from uh, the I, bundle that was downloaded from App Store. Uh, being honest, I haven't heard about these issues so far, but the fact is that if device is jailbroken, you can access everything, hard or simple, but if device is jailbroken, you can really access everything. So if you want to believe the device will never be jailbroken, and if you want to believe that Apple is super good and you can trust Apple, you can rely on everything that Apple provides, it's okay. But if you're building something that requires additional layer of security guarantees, you should build some security perimeters on your own, right? So it really depends on the app and on your situation. Being you, I would never store keys in a plain text in the source code. All right, so uh, you're saying that it's also impossible to detect the devices uh, jailbroken? No, no, I'm not saying. It's possible. Um, it depends on iOS version, actually, because there is no, as far as I know, there is no public API for that. So Apple don't provide anything to detect if device is jailbroken, but all this iOS version actually have, you know, some workarounds, tips and tricks, how to detect it. I'm just saying that if you don't care that device may be jailbroken and your app may be used on jailbroken device with access to everything, it's up to you. But if you do care, in this case, probably you should not trust Keychain at all. 
because this is the same. The keychain will be broken if the device is jailbroken. And as far as we know, keychain is the most secure place to put your keys, right? So it depends on your level of, I know, paranoia, on the level of how really sensitive your data is. Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? Hello. Hey. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, well, the question is, uh, you present uh, like quite a lot of uh, open source libraries for using encryption or whatever, crypto swift libraries and so on. And uh, the question is, uh, how can we trust those libraries? Because, uh, well, nobody, for, for, the, for the truth, nobody really spends time inspecting those libraries and they're like, ah, whatever, it solves my case. So what, what are the trust proofs for the libraries? Thanks. This is a super cool question, really. Thank you. Why? Because when you're selecting a library for animation, it's super easy. All of them have a GIF image and you can just take a look on the GIF image of animation and understand whether you like it or not. Or you can take a look on the stars count on a GitHub. And it's easy. But when we're talking about security, it's not so easy, right? So there are several tips for you. First of all, it depends on your level of paranoia. Really, but honestly, sooner or later, you will need to trust something. Just the level of this trust depends on your level of paranoia. So you can trust the, the, the native components that operating system, the ecosystem provides in iOS and Android, so you can rely on them. Then uh, you can take a look on the company that ship a library on a GitHub. For example, some companies have their own security scientists, like in Google. Right? And uh, then if the library is written by a security scientist and like, or engineers with a good reputation, and it, it increases the, chance, the chances and the probability that this library might be audited, for example, then um, you should take a look on the GitHub issues. Do they respond? on issues connected with security. If you remember two years ago, the situation with IF networking library in iOS, in, in short, there was a large networking library in iOS that everyone was using. And in one of the versions of this library, people found an, a, a security mistake, let's say so. Actually, your application was trusting any server without checking whether the server certificate was valid, SSL certificate was valid, valid, it just always returned true on the method that checks validity of certificate. And those people, they found this vulnerability and they wrote a message to IF networking, to their contributors in private channels. Hey, please, you have a vulnerability, please fix it. But they had no response. They waited for a month or so, and then they posted an issue pub pub publicly, right? right? So a lot of people, at this issue actually attracts a lot of attention because this library was used in 100,000 of the apps, literally. And all of these 100,000 of the apps had this vulnerability. And uh, the maintainers respond and then fix it, but in fact, they were fixing one thing and ruining another thing. So those guys, they said, hey, you actually fixed this one problem, but you created another problem. Please do something. And the story actually was the same. No one responded. And they posted again an issue publicly. And again, the attracts a lot of attention. It was a huge wave of hate. And um, as a result, with all these issues, there were two new updates of this library. And there were a lot of blog posts saying, hey, please update to these new versions of this library, to these new versions of Hadn't Working. So, in short, keep an eye on things you're trying to use. And if you already see that on a GitHub tracker there are open issues, open security issues, nobody responds on, it's probably a bad sign. Um, However, there are some libraries that are based on one single, one single core, like C core, and they just have wrappers. Like, for example, lib, oh, there is no such example, like um, NACL or libsodium. It's a single C library with, written in, I don't know, 19th, 90s probably, and it just has a lot of wrappers. 
So this probably is better than single ropers created by every community. Um, what else, what else, what else to say? Just keep an eye, just, I don't know, read the Daniel Bernstein blog. Keep an eye on that. I mean, depends on your level of paranoia. There are some tools, as I said before, there are some tools on this, by this link, and there is a similar link for Android that the libraries we checked, we didn't do any audit, but we just looked at them and tried them a little bit and think that they are okay to use. But again, depending on how much time you have, how much money you have, how much effort you want to put in. Thanks. You're welcome. One last question, okay? If it's okay? Okay, one last question and then we should go for a break because, you know. Everybody's hungry. Yeah. Is it a lunch break, no? No, it's just a coffee break. The coffee is frozen already. Yeah, so hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Really cute slides. But, Thank uh, you. Uh, like the difference is uh, everything is all about the costs, and uh, like when you want to protect your data, the, it should be really hard to attack, her and uh, he should spend much more resources uh, to break the defense to get uh, to get the data. Like. Mm, I mean that uh, the attacker should spend uh, much more resources than the data costs. Like, uh, and do you have any tips how to measure that the level of security is enough, or how to measure <laughs> that, uh, like? Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a business metric, so it's not a technical metric. It's a business metric. Um, it's it's a cost of reputation. It's you know it's a summary of things that. You, the risks and the losses you will got if your database, for example, will be leaked. You just need, need to imagine and you just need to talk with your business guys saying like, hey, we have a database with two million of records with private data of real people. What reputation risks we will have if this thing will leak? Right? And they will say you, hmm, probably we will be sued, probably we will appear on the newspapers, probably we will appear on TechCrunch, etc., etc., and probably our stocks will fall in like 20% or something like that. This is exactly the amount of money company would probably, will probably lose if your database will be leaked. So the, I believe that the only thing to measure if it's okay for you to stop implementing new and new techni uh, security techniques is to measure is to measure the business losses, just the amount of money you need to recreate, re-implement all this code to uh, get this data back if it's leaked, right, or to decrypt it if it was encrypted but by some wires or something like that. You just calculate all these costs for work, for reputation, for changing the system, firing developers, adding new developers, etc., etc., etc. And when you think that the number is large enough, you just stop, or small enough, you just stop implementing all the security te techniques. I think let's let's thank you thank you a lot for your questions